It's the destiny of the human race expressed in numbers. And it's the reason the Empire will take us. They're worried you can predict the future. They're worried people believe I can. And they don't like the future I predict. Which is what? Hey guys, Pete here. This will be my breakdown for the first two episodes of the first season of Foundation, the Apple TV Plus adaptation of the classic sci-fi series by Isaac Asimov. They delivered two long episodes that are dense, and especially in the first one, there are a lot of important details. I put together a fairly comprehensive recap, which is also long, and so I added chapters in case you're already familiar with the story and you just want to skip to the good stuff. As a warning, this video will contain spoilers if you haven't watched the first two episodes. I will be talking about the book series that the show's based on without giving away any spoilers for future plot points that come from reading them. With that out of the way, let's get into it. If you've read Isaac Asimov's Foundation books, watched my intro videos, or read any of the press about the TV show, then you know the story spans a long period of time. If not, there's a monologue from Gail Dornick to open the series that sets it up. What's interesting here is that it comes from the perspective of the future. She says that one day she'll learn the names Salvor Hardin, Hober Mallow, and the Mule. As she's talking, viewers are introduced to Salvor, the planet Terminus, and the mysterious vault that hovers above the ground there. We see some local kids try to approach it and get an explanation from Salvor, who they refer to as the Warden, that the vault is warning them to stay away. Although it's implied that she's not affected by the null field it generates. Right off the bat, you get the idea that the story is going to be big. You're introduced to two timelines and three planets in the first 10 minutes. The narration shifts from the future to remembering the past, and you meet Harry Seldon and his adopted son Rach 35 years prior at the Imperial Library on the Empire's capital planet Trantor. They're discussing Gale's arrival, and then we meet her on her homeworld of Synax. You see her looking at her prayer stones that she removed before her journey to Trantor to meet Harry. These are cultural markers that every member of the Seer's Church has in their cheeks. You get the feeling that her leaving has set her apart from her people, and later learn that math and science go against their beliefs. As you learn more about her background, you find out that the waters are rising on Synax, threatening their way of life, and the people have turned to faith for answers. This led to the universities being burned down and a purge of intellectuals. Gail taught herself math hoping to help save her people. She won a contest by solving a problem called the Abraxas Conjecture, which no one had been able to figure out for over 500 years. After that, she gets offered a job by Harry Seldon and says goodbye to her parents before leaving Synax for good. She gets transported to a jump ship, which is our introduction to the hyperspatial travel that made it possible for humans to settle on habitable planets throughout the galaxy. She meets a man named Gerald just before they're put to sleep for the jump. He turns out to be an agent of the Empire that was sent to spy on her. He tells her they have to be put to sleep because sometimes it can feel like your mind and body are taking different trips. They have to be secured in these pods because the artificial gravity has to be turned off so they can navigate the jump. For some reason, Gale wakes up while they're in transit, which is strange, and she's immediately sedated by one of the spacers working on the ship. If you're curious as to what these spacers are, I'll come back to them after the recap. When she arrives on Trantor, she takes the star bridge down to the planet, and there's a lot of world building in the details while she's on her way to meet Rach who takes her to Harry. You learn that billions of people live below the surface on 100 subterranean levels where they never see the sun or the stars. Trantor is an ecumenopolis. The entire planet is encompassed by the city. As the surface became completely developed, they started to build down and then they do things like projecting skies overhead on the lower levels to make it look more natural. Harry asks her some questions about how she solved the problem in an effort to get to know her, and then he drops it on her that they're going to be arrested tomorrow. When she asks why, he questions if she's familiar with his work on psychohistory. He says it's the destiny of the human race expressed in numbers. When she hears this, she asks if they're worried that he can predict the future, and he says that they're worried that people believe he can, and they don't like the future he predicts. He tells her that Trantor is going to be destroyed and the Empire will fall. 
when he shows her the prime radiant, which is the visual representation of his equations, she realizes that they believe she's the only one that can prove him wrong. Harry agrees that that's true. If he was wrong, she would be able to prove it, but he's not. This is all bad news for her. She left home where she would have been arrested, only to find out she'll face the same thing on Trantor. On the way out, she asks Rach to take her to a seer church, and the priest knows who she is. And he isn't a fan of Selden's prophecies either. You also meet the genetic dynasty of Dawn, Day, and Dusk. They're all clones of Emperor Cleon I who have been ruling for four centuries. You see that they do consider Selden as a threat, and also that they can be cruel when Day kills a man who's been working for him for over 60 years just for being in possession of something that Harry wrote. The three versions of the same person at three different ages have complete control of the Empire. Day sits on the middle throne as the leader until Dawn grows old enough to take his place. Dusk advises his younger selves and the cycle continues. Edo Demerzel is their first minister and appears to assist in managing everything. On top of going after Harry and Gale, the Cleons are dealing with a dispute over resources between two planets that hate each other, Anacreon and Thespis. Because some agents of the Empire were killed in the dispute, they've been summoned to answer for that and to try to avoid an all-out war. Gale and Harry are arrested and their trial is public. Regular citizens are able to watch it, with the Cleons watching very closely. Harry explains that psychohistory is a predictive model designed to forecast the behavior of very large populations. When questioned as to what it says about the Empire, he says it's going to fall in 500 years or possibly sooner. They accuse him of trying to undermine an empire that's existed for 12,000 years. And he pleads that he's not a revolutionary, it's just what the math says. He claims the collapse is too far along, it can't be stopped, but they can shorten the 30,000 years of barbarism that's going to follow it. They can cut that to just 1,000 years. He can't prove any of this. His predictions can't be checked because no one really understands the math except for Gale. So after the first day of questioning, Gerald comes back and gives Gal the Prime Radiant. He tells her that she has to disavow Harry and say that his math is wrong. And if for some reason the equations turn out to be correct, the Empire will deal with that. They'll fix the problems without terrifying trillions of people. He gives her an ultimatum. Either she says that Harry's wrong and he dies, and if she doesn't, she dies. When she takes the Prime Radiant back to her room, she's able to activate it and see the equations. In court the next day, Harry is asked directly how he would shorten the period of chaos. His plan is to create an Encyclopedia Galactica. Essentially, collect all of mankind's knowledge and then print it and distribute it. After the fall, a new empire will rise from the ashes, and this will serve as a foundation of knowledge for them to build upon. When they call Gale to testify, she goes against the Empire, verifying that Selden's math is correct, and she confirms that the Empire is dying. As they're leaving the courtroom, she senses that something's wrong with the Starbridge and tells Harry about it. Then it cuts to two simultaneous suicide bomber attacks on the bridge and the platform. You see it kill everyone there as it falls out of orbit to wrap around the planet, tearing 50 levels down. There's 100 million people dead, and there's a fear that the outer reaches may be in rebellion. Rach gives Gale a chance to give Harry up, but she refuses and they're taken in front of the Emperor. Harry's work has convinced him that things are going to get worse, so the Starbridge attack isn't a surprise. He doesn't say that he predicted that that would happen specifically, but it sounds like he knew something would. And he explains he can't figure out who did it because he can't predict individuals' actions. And then when asked if the fall can be slowed down, he says yes, they need to end the genetic dynasty. Dusk gets angry about that, saying that the dynasty stopped the wars. Harry stands by. He says that change will help things, but there's no movement on either side. When they ask why they shouldn't just kill Harry, Gal steps in and says that it would actually speed things up, that she saw that when she looked at the equations. She says that Harry's hope, and if they kill hope, then the people will kill them. 
When they're alone together, Gale realizes the contest was set up to find someone that could understand Selden's equations. He just reached out and got to her before they did. They're brought back in and told that the decision is to let them continue their work on psychohistory but not on Trantor. They're being allowed to travel by slow ship to an uninhabited planet called Terminus, which of course we saw at the beginning. Without a jump ship, the trip will take them years. They've been exiled, and if psychohistory turns out to be fraudulent, then the Foundation will just be allowed to wither. And if it's useful, the Empire can just co-opt it for themselves. Terminus is on the periphery, and it neighbors the two kingdoms that are apparently behind the Starbridge attack. On the way out, Gale begins to realize that exile was always Harry's plan. He says the planet is perfect for what they need to do, and that's the twist, is that even though he was gambling to a certain extent on these things, everything had been planned in advance and it did work out how he expected. He tells her, you came here to save your world, why not think bigger? Save the galaxy, and then it cuts to Terminus 35 years later. The narration picks back up, saying no one could approach the vault except for an outlier like Salvor Hardin. Gail says she always wondered if when Harry was formulating the plan, did he realize the galaxy's fate would rest on what she found inside? She thinks he did, and thinks that's what he feared the most. In the beginning of episode 2, the Cleons still can't figure out who contracted the people who were responsible for the Starbridge attack. Demerzel's looking into it. She goes to a biohacking place at one point, and without anything else to go on, Brother Day still just kinda wants to kill Harry. But Demerzel won't let it happen because she knows there's nothing to connect him to the crime. Both Anacreon and Thespis deny being involved, and that seems like they're probably telling the truth. They hate each other, so it doesn't really make sense for them to collaborate on the attack. We see that Dusk is getting old, and we see that there's a natural tension that exists between him and Day. We can imagine that this probably always happens. And he goes to see the seer priest at the church that Gale went to, where he sees the destruction of what happened firsthand. He's trying to find out if Gale is a seer. Based on the weird stuff we've seen around her, it's an interesting question. While they're there, Demerzel gets hit by a falling rock, and then later we see Brother Dawn watching as she repairs herself. In that, she's revealed to be a robot. And you may have noticed that there aren't any real robots around in Trantor as it is. Brother Dawn says that all of her kind had died, and she corrects him saying they didn't die, they were destroyed by his kind. So she does her best to act like a human, and at this point, it's not really clear how well her true identity is covered up. After talking to the Anacreon and the Thespin they have in their custody, Dust decides that mercy is the right way to go. Brother Day doesn't listen and decides to make an example of the Outer Worlds. He sends ships to attack the planet and then executes the members of the delegation who came to Trantor, but leaves the two leaders alive to go back and tell their people how they failed. There's a teaching moment here for Brother Dawn. Demerzel tells him it won't always be like this. When he asks exactly how often do they choose to do things like this, she just says you always do. On the slow ship, Gale and Rach have started a relationship that's getting serious, and you learn that there's four months and four years left of the trip. You see that everyone's getting prepared to live. They're learning new skills. You meet some of the new characters that would still be around in Salvor's timeline. If nothing else, the colonists look serious. They believe that the Empire is going to fall and what they're doing is going to be very important with the Foundation to preserve knowledge and rebuild the civilization. There's a side story here about a pregnancy that Gale's involved in. It appears that women who get pregnant opt to preserve that until after they make it to Terminus. So it makes you wonder if Rach and Gale won't be the parents of somebody who turns out to be important. And I guess it should be noted that Salvor Hardin isn't born yet. We do see the two characters here that are cast to play her parents when they're much younger than what they'll be in that timeline. But otherwise, I don't see how this pregnancy thing is really essential if it's not going to pay off later. Either way, they're trying to hide their relationship from Harry, and in his interactions you can see that he realizes that the Foundation is going to be successful, at least the plan is fully in motion, but that his time with it is coming to an end. The calculations show that it's going to be a tough road for the people who are left behind. Something like a mortality rate of 34.2% after 5 years on Terminus. Although he says this is trending downward, so their training is working. 
In their conversation, there's also a mention of the robot wars and the hanging of AI sympathizers in an orchard in the Imperial Gardens. This all refers back to what Demerzel was telling Brother Dawn about her kind being destroyed by humans. The episode comes to an end as Gail's following her normal routine. She's in the pool swimming and then she gets a feeling that something's wrong and decides to leave. She goes looking for Rach and can't find him and that leads her to Harry's room where she sees Rach stabbing him and taking his life. We also see that Rach takes something from behind his ear before he goes after her. And then he puts her in a pod, throwing his knife inside, telling her that he loves her and then he launches it. The pod seems to be programmed and it looks like she's probably being put to sleep for a period of time. It's definitely not clear if her interrupting what happened in Harry's room is why she's on the pod, as all of her interactions with Harry earlier made it seem like he was grooming her to be the leader on Terminus. He even sent her to that meeting to sit in in his place. It's definitely possible that she interrupted because of that feeling she had, and then Rach had to change his plan, which we're going to have to wait and see what was really going on with that, because all of his interactions with Harry portrayed them having a close and loving relationship. There was the awkward interaction at dinner. We hadn't seen anything like that between them before. Everything we'd seen from Rach was that he was concerned, even though he might not have been 100% positive that Harry was right. And there definitely are seeds planted there where it could go the other way. Gail telling him that the math wasn't complete, and it's a pretty good cliffhanger when you think about it like that. So I'm excited to see where it goes in the next episode. So to wrap it all up, Harry used psychohistory to forecast the fall of the Empire. He believes what the math is telling him and knows that the Cleons will never give up their power willingly. By solving Abraxas when no one else could, Gale is considered the best person to check if his work is correct. She gets pulled into the situation, she decides to go against the Empire, and this all leads to all these people on the slow ship being exiled to Terminus to create the Foundation. There's quite a few mysteries to think about. First and foremost, who's really behind the attack on the Star Bridge? It definitely doesn't seem like the people that are being punished are the ones who did it, which means there could be blowback from that, but also that there could be another force in play. Gail has plenty of mysteries around her too, this idea that she senses things. Why did she wake up during the jump? Where did she go at the end? Is she hibernating and for how long? What was the significance of the zygote scene? Is part of the reason that they gender swap this character because she's going to have descendants on Terminus? Why did Rach kill Harry? That feels like it was part of the plan, rather than some murderous rage. But then how did Gale walking in change things? What was the device he took from behind Harry's ear? What's going on with the vault? How did it get there? Because it seems beyond Harry's natural skill set, although he did have a lot of people working for him. And what's going on with the Cleons having a robot? They kept Demerzel mostly in the background in these two episodes. But even if you don't know anything about the books, I'm sure she's starting to pique your interest. As for a review, it looks really fantastic, and that's super promising for it being around long enough to turn into something that will be remembered as a great TV series. Sci-fi of this scale is tough to pull off, and there's a balance with all the necessary world building you have to do in the beginning to set the stage, with it not being overwhelming and finding something compelling, something watchable to hook viewers in. In this case, you're also working with a book series that people won't want to see changed in any way. For that reason, I tried to watch this without comparing it too much to the books, since in my opinion there are some obvious problems in making an overly faithful adaptation for TV. Generally, I think the creators took most of those things into account and came up with clever solutions. It turns out, though, that the trick is to make those changes where they don't disrupt the big ideas behind the original. Every change you make affects the rest of the story, and only time will tell if they'll be able to pull that off. The solution to make the Emperor's clones is a novel idea, and you can't go wrong with Lee Pace. And I especially like the idea that even though they're all copies of the same man, they still want to distinguish themselves. And we're just going to have to see where they take the genetic dynasty as there's really no reason to think they're going to give up power or that the people on Terminus would be able to undermine that anytime soon. 
a lot of what I liked about the books is the way that people who don't understand the plan they're following react to that. And then the bigger ideas about what is the right way to create a new civilization. Personalities present themselves at the right time, but none of the characters are important in the long run beyond the situation that they're faced with. So it comes off a little strange when you introduce ideas around characters being special. Changing it up isn't necessarily bad, but hopefully it won't take away from the original story's appeal. After watching the first two episodes, I'm dazzled by the visuals and most of the performances, and feel optimistic overall. I think it was a good start, and even if everything doesn't work out in the first season, it's comforting knowing that there's still a lot of good story they can draw from in the future. One thing that stands out as a big question mark for me is Demerzel being involved in killing based on the three laws of robotics. I know there's the Xeroth law, but they're going to have to address this at some point. I mentioned that I would come back to the spacers. It's not clear what they're doing with them here. They almost look like robots. In Asimov's Robot series, spacers are people who decided that they wanted to live away from Earth after hyperspatial travel became common. This is a real simplification, but humans became divided into two groups. The people on Earth at that time, they were sort of anti-robot, they wanted things to stay more or less the same, and the spacers wanted to go out and colonize and become something different. I also mentioned how Gale's narration was from the perspective of the future. In the books, we had excerpts from the Encyclopedia Galactica, the same book that they go to Terminus to create. So those give historical accounts from a time later about what's going on in the actual timeline. So that's a neat nod the way that they did that, with the obvious change that some of these characters are going to be around longer than just the period of time where they're introduced. They kept Harry Seldon mostly the same. His characterization, what he was trying to do, that all sticks pretty close to the books. Where you see the differences, and it would take a whole nother video to actually point all those out, is where they're giving these other characters a story in an effort to try to get us to care about them. And I think that's a good place to leave things. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you want to include things about the book series, please mark those. We don't want to spoil it for everyone else. Let me know any theories that you came up with, how you think things might play out. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.